Hi, my name is Alan Finney for ValuesGov.ca. One of the things that became obvious to me early in making this video is that politicians won't reform democracy in Canada. Basic democratic principles are being thrown out the window by politicians and nobody's doing anything about it. And it became obvious to me that the only people who can reform democracy in Canada are Canadians, you and me. And the only reason I decided to make this video is that there is a solution where average Canadians can restructure democracy in Canada. And I mean fundamentally restructure democracy, democracy 2.0. And you don't have to wear yellow vests or riot in the streets or join a political party. It's called the democracy operating system. And I'll explain that in a bit as well. When I first started looking into how democracy really operates in Canada, I ran across two very different ideas, and I mean wildly different ideas. And the first one is this, a system of government for the people, by the people. And that's what probably comes to mind for most Canadians. But the other idea I found goes like this, democracy is really just a mask for rule by the elite. And that definition was first put forward in the 1900s by several different people. So that was the starting point for my investigation. Is it for the people, by the people, or a mask for rule by the elite? And no matter what I found out, I had to have a solution. Otherwise, there's no point. There's lots of people pointing out the problems. And I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of Canadian politics. It's gone well beyond anything that I even consider rational, never mind democratic. The whole system is out of control. When you have politicians that are trying to tell Canadians what they can or can't talk about, I fear for the future of democracy. Controlling the flow of information is how dictators operate. But more to the point, what is fundamentally wrong with democracy in Canada when somebody can do this? So the first thing I did was to take a hard look at how Canadian democracy is structured, the basic operating system. Because every day in legislatures just like this one, Politicians are making decisions that will affect generations of Canadians. And these politicians are passionate guys, and they may even think they're doing the right thing. I mean, they're having debates, yelling at each other, calling each other names. But does this result in what you and I would consider democracy? Is this good governance for the people, by the people? Is this what you and I really need? Is it what we want? Because to me, it just sounds like acrimonious political debates. So let's have a look at the current operating system first, the state of the art, and then we'll see if we can improve things from there. It seems like prime ministers and premiers are the ones really running the show. These guys are deciding on everything from taxes to pipelines to the environment, healthcare, agriculture. They can put all of us in debt. And long after we vote them out, you and I have to live with the decisions that they made. So the big question for me was, is this a democracy? What do I get to say about it? I mean, if they're making decisions that affect my life, do I get some input? And of course, the standard answer is yes, I get to say whatever I want. It's a democracy. To which I reply, so what? Is anything that you and I say even considered by these people? Or do I have to join some political party? Which I simply don't have the time to do. And I imagine you don't either. And even if I did, would that change anything? But this is how democracy works right across Canada. This is the state of the art. And I'm supposed to have a say in all this somehow. And that part of it never seemed very clear to me. So could democracy in Canada really be ruled by the elite? And at the end of the day, what I found out after researching this and writing a book about it, the only conclusion that I can come to is that average Canadians have no effective representation in this system. And I mean effective representation. I mean, we're supposed to, but we don't. Let me explain. Let me ask you if this sounds like a democracy. I vote for somebody to represent me, and then somebody else tells him how to vote. And not only do they tell him how to vote, they also tell him what he can say and what he can't say. And for the most part, he just goes along with it. 
And regardless of what definition you put on it, that's how legislatures like this one operate, day in and day out, year after year, right across Canada. Your representative is a counted vote. They even have a name for it, party discipline. But it extends well beyond party discipline, which I'll get into in a bit. So how big of a problem is this? Well, a study published by the Political Science Association rated Canada as the most centralized democracy in the world, with power concentrated in the hands of, you guessed it, the Prime Minister. The study looked at 22 parliaments that are operated like Canada's, and that was the conclusion. In fact, Canada has been called an elected dictatorship by a number of people, and it turns out they were right. And this is a peer-reviewed study by a very credible organization. So is this study right? Is Canada really an elected dictatorship? I'll get into some more details in a minute or two, and then you can tell me. And the other big question is, if the study is right, who's going to fix it? The dictator? And the conclusion I came to is the only people who are going to fix the Canadian political system are the people of Canada. Judges won't do it, senators won't do it, the media won't do it, and the Prime Minister sure as hell won't do it. And that leaves you and me, average Canadians. And yes, this problem is recognized by the government itself. Parliament has tried to reform itself, but we still have Prime Ministers running things however they want. I mean, what about this guy? contempt of parliament, falsifying documents, banishing the media. He shut down parliament not once, but twice, purely for political reasons. And what happened about it? Nothing. And then this guy comes in and says he's going to fix everything that Harper broke. Did he? I don't think so. And more to the point, is this any way to run a government with one guy in charge, promising to fix things that the last guy didn't? Does that sound anything like good governance? I've worked in the mainstream media and inside government, so I've seen both of these systems up close. And when I was working for the government, I always said that if people really knew how governments operated, there would be riots in the street. And I wrote a book about it. And in my book, I wrote about an online platform for democracy, something that could fundamentally change how governments operate. And these systems have now been developed from several organizations. It's an operating system for democracy, for people, and they're available right now. Basically, a democracy operating system is a system of organizing people, and it provides a credible platform for discussion and voting. It's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that's the two key things about a democracy operating system organization and credibility and accessibility okay three things anyway the software is now available it's being used by large corporations nonprofits political groups your gardening club could use it and the objective is to get a democracy operating system in one riding in Canada as a good start right now information flows from the government to people there's no flow of information from people back to the government. Not in any credible way, and certainly not in a formalized, open and accessible public forum. And the government could set up a system like this, but they're not going to, for exactly the same reason that they can't reform democracy. And everybody talks about disruptive technologies, but this has to be the disruptive technology for democracy, hands down. In fact, one of the developers of this software says it will eventually replace the political process. Because this system doesn't require politicians. Representatives, maybe, but not politicians. So if Canadians want a better system of government, we're going to have to do it ourselves. And now we have a tool to do it. Think of it as a reset button for the Canadian political system. And it's not like you and I want to fix democracy. We would rather just go about our lives and have good, honest government with good, honest politicians. But that hasn't happened in 150 years, and it's not going to happen now. In fact, it's only going to get worse. And more to the point, we've run out of time. There is no time left hoping that some political party is going to come along and restructure democracy. It simply won't happen. Our current system is fundamentally broken. 
Three out of four young people, 75% of young people didn't vote in the last election. They've abandoned this system. They see it for what it is. So what's the future for democracy in Canada where 75% of people won't even be voting? But thanks to people like this and software like this, you and I can take control of an out of control system where basic democratic principles are being thrown out the window. And the politicians and their pals aren't going to own it. We will, the Canadian people will own it, will be in charge of it, and it will fundamentally change how Canada is governed. It's a new way of running a democracy, and all that it does is bring people back into the equation. It provides an organizational structure and a credible voting system. In fact, a voting system of record for the people. It's how a democracy is actually supposed to work. It's not some playground for politicians to record sound bites. Think of it like this. Whoever owns the operating system controls the government. And right now, these people own the operating system. They control your member of parliament, they control the voting system, and they appoint the judges and the civil service. The corporations and the political parties that benefit from our current system of government aren't going to change it. You don't kill the goose that's laying golden eggs. And this is what some people call the 1%. But you just have to look at the numbers to see that on the face of it, this system can't work. Canadians elect 300 or so MPs for a country of 30 some million people. So right off the bat, your MP is one in a million, 0.001%. How can one person represent a million people? It's impossible. And in this system that they set up, you and I have no effective representation because the person you vote for, your member of parliament, your 0.001% is a potted plant. Seriously, it's a potted plant. And I didn't call him a potted plant. Sitting prime minister, former prime minister, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, called your representative, your member of parliament, a potted plant. Now, if I call my MP a potted plant, that's one thing. But if a sitting prime minister calls my representative a potted plant, that's a whole new level of potted plant. And what he really meant by potted plant is that all your representative is, is a counted vote for the ruling political party. This is party discipline in a nutshell. And that means that your representative votes how he's told to vote. And I'll be discussing party discipline in depth in another video, but party discipline means your representative is owned by the people that get him elected. The political parties handpick the candidates. They get him elected with party money, and then they tell him how to vote. They own him, lock, stock, and barrel. It's a system of control. Your member of parliament is a potted plant. Pierre Elliott Trudeau was right. And this is standard operating procedure right across Canada. This is the state of the art. It's how the 0.0001% control the uh, 0.001%. Anyway, there's lots of zeros flying around. So while I'm on the topic, let's move up the food chain a little to something they call the cabinet. That's the next layer of control. The cabinet ministers, these guys have their hands on the real power in government. This is where democracy really happens, apparently. Well, who appoints the cabinet? Who hires and fires the cabinet minister? And that's the real boss in this system, the real control mechanism, the prime minister. And you either toe the party line or this guy fires you. The prime minister is the king, the big boss. He runs the show. It's an elected dictatorship. So if you're a member of parliament, your representative in this system is a potted plant, where does that leave you and me? What are average Canadians? Fertilizer? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why that study found that Canada is the most centralized democracy in the world. And they were comparing governments that have the same type of parliament that we do. The United Kingdom, Sweden, Japan, Australia, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Norway, Germany. And Canada is the most centralized democracy in the world. That's just astounding. So what's the cure for this situation? It goes by a number of names, but I like democracy operating system. There's a bunch of names for it. Liquid democracy, liquid feedback, participatory democracy, e-democracy. 
And really, this is the only practical solution to our current state of democracy. And what a democracy operating system really does is provide people with an online organizing platform. Effective reform of our current political system requires organization. So how are we going to accomplish that? Start another political party? Riot in the streets? It won't work. And as we've seen, you can't change the existing structure from inside the structure. It doesn't work. Buckminster Fuller said it best. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. A democracy operating system makes the existing model obsolete. And that's what it is, a new model. The existing model is a closed system. You and I don't count. The new model is an open system, all day, every day, 365 days a year. Canadians control the debate, we control the system, it's ours. And it's just like everything else in Canada. Everybody admits there's a big problem, but nobody actually does anything about it. Because the control system, the political parties and their prime minister, keep the lid firmly clamped down. And it's not like people on the inside haven't tried to reform democracy in Canada. The McGrath Committee in the 1980s tried and failed, as did the Lebrouve or Lefrouve Committee before that. These were parliamentary committees who were set up to reform democracy, and they failed. The system is incapable of reforming itself, unless you think that this guy will reform democracy by himself, because he's in charge of it, by all accounts. The Samara Center for Democracy did the first ever exit survey of sitting members of parliament, which just means they asked MPs what their experience was as a member of parliament. This is the title of the book they wrote about it. They called it The Tragedy in the Commons. Alison Loeb, one of the authors, had this to say, quote, the prime minister has a lot of tools at his disposal for helping ensure compliance. For example, the postings. Who gets posted to committees and cabinet positions? It's up to the Prime Minister to decide how that happens. It isn't like there's an application process or any formal transparency about it. Some MPs are quite shocked by the appointments." End of quote. But in order to change anything, you need the tools to do it. And that's what a democracy operating system provides. Instead of an election every four or five years, you and I now have access to our democratic process all day, every day. And you can spend 10 minutes on it or you can spend 10 hours, but you now have a choice and a say in the matter. And people are already using this, maybe not in a political writing in Canada, but it is being used. It's available. And I'll get into system implementation in another video, but the software is here. How did Iceland kick out their corrupt banking system and write a new constitution for their country? Well, there's only 300,000 people in Iceland, and everybody knows everybody else. 200,000 of them live in the capital city alone. Icelandic people can organize themselves. And that's been a fundamental principle of how any meaningful social change has ever happened, the ability to organize. Compare this to Canada, 30 some million people spread across 9,000 kilometers in six and a half time zones. How are you going to organize Canadians? You have to do it online. There is no other practical way. Everything's online. Your banking, taxes, credit cards, government services, all delivered online. Why not democracy? The problem up until now was no credible organizational software, unless you consider Facebook or Twitter organizational software. The other major point is that a democracy operating system takes big money out of the equation. No corporate sponsors, no lobbying industry, no politicians required. One person, one vote. It's a voting system of record for every Canadian. And that's it in a nutshell a voting system of record that is owned by you and me. No ambiguity, no loaded referendum questions, no fudging, no nonsense. It's the definitive vote on an issue in your riding. You can't argue with it. Only registered voters have access to this system. Now imagine a system like this in every riding in Canada. And all those systems can talk to each other. 
Now, I can't predict what votes will take place in this system, but my thoughts are that people will vote on issues based on their values. The environment, health care, social programs. It's all up for debate and all up for voting. And that vote becomes a vote of record. And why would that be important? Because right now you have absolutely no say in how your governments spend your tax dollars. They can tell you that they're going to do something, but there is no recourse if they don't. There is no accountability. In fact, court cases in Canada have confirmed that it's legally okay for a politician to lie to you or to break election promises. And governments couldn't ignore this. Well, well, they could, but it would be pretty tough. But governments could just ignore it. There's nothing compelling them to act on anything. So let's talk about two different court systems here. The court of public opinion and a court of law. If the government of Canada ignored a credible vote from taxpayers across Canada, it would be like ignoring, I don't know, referendum results. But let's just say they did ignore it. A dictator can do what he wants. So now let's go to a court of law. The only way to prove anything in a court of law is with verifiable, credible information like fingerprints or DNA or something. So what does a democracy operating system provide? Credible, verified information. It's like the DNA of democracy. How many lawyers would love to get their hands on something like that? Let's compare this to the current system. Every four or five years, we vote for someone to manage our government departments. And we want good managers. And where the whole thing breaks down is the politicians. There's maybe four people on the ballot box, and they're all owned by political parties because you can't get elected in Canada without party money. It doesn't happen. Independents have tried, but only a handful of independents have ever been elected in Canada. So you and I get served up choices that are handpicked by political parties. You can't vote in your neighbor, even if he is a better choice. So right off, you have no real choice in who you get to vote for. So this is where a democracy operating system comes into the equation. Because a democracy operating system operates in real time. You don't have to wait four or five years to vote for somebody to replace the other guy that didn't do what you told him to do. In other words, if a majority of people in a riding decided their representative wasn't acting on their priorities, they could just fire him. It's a democracy. And then try the next guy until they find somebody who would act on their priorities. And if that was the case, why would you fire him after four or five years? If he's doing a good job, just keep him on. Pretty simple, really. And that's what could happen with a democracy operating system. And I hear what you're saying. Alan, this will never work. It's too simple. It's too easy. It's too accessible for everyone. We can't fix something as big and complicated as government with some software on our computers or a cell phone. But isn't democracy supposed to be accessible? Aren't people supposed to have access to their system of government? Isn't that the basic promise of democracy, the central idea that you and I have a say? In fact, this guy says his software will eventually replace our current political system. Think about that. And let me get this out of the way right up front. Yes, the systems are secure. In fact, more secure than online banking or this or this. In fact, these systems require more security than our present system of voter registration. They're verified on the ground and online. You can't hack the system and register more votes than there are voters in a riding. Everything is online today. All our government services are already online systems are secure. The other thing that people say is that we the people are incapable of running governments. Well, who are you voting for? Machines? You're voting for people to run your government. But just to clear up this point, I'm going to give you a couple of examples where people ran their own affairs without politicians, without governments. Here's one example. This university in Bangor, Wales was built by a bunch of farmers and miners. In the late 1800s, Bangor, Wales was a mining and farming town. The miners and farmers wanted their kids to have a better education. So they all got together and pledged a part of their income to build a university. No politicians involved, just people making decisions about what they want. 
and it opened its doors in 1884, and Bangor, Wales is now a university town with over 10,000 students a year. It's a lovely place, kind of looks like Hogwarts. And no government did this. It was built by farmers and miners. And when people have input into projects, they take ownership. So what about social programs? Could people actually run their own social programs without politicians? Well, that's exactly what they did in England prior to World War I. Friendly societies provided social services. That's what they were called, friendly societies. So did unions and other trade organizations, and people got looked after. And at the end of World War I, the government took over and started providing these services. So yes, people actually are quite capable of looking after their own affairs without politicians. I mean, what did people do before government stepped in? Things ran, people got things done. How did roads get built before personal income tax was brought in? Streets got built, people got looked after, services were delivered. Personal income tax was introduced in Canada in 1917. Canadian Confederation was in 1867. How did things get built for 50 years before we had personal income tax? So what does a democracy operating system actually do? It decentralizes a top-down autocratic system of government. And democracy is not supposed to be a militaristic top-down system of command and control. That's not the idea. So would decentralizing the Canadian government work? Huge corporations far bigger than the Government of Canada have been decentralized for decades. And I'll cover this in another video because it's a big topic. But if you're interested in finding out more about decentralization, just Google Peter Drucker or the spider and the starfish. And I'll just leave you with this. How are you going to get Canadians, average Canadians, together to do something? The only way to do it is online. The democracy operating system does just that. It's an organizational tool and a system of registered voting for you and me. It's democracy in the truest sense of the word, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I've had it up to my eyeballs with the current political system in Canada, and we've run out of time. The fact is, with party discipline, which was brought in by Sir John A. Macdonald in the second parliament in Canada, we've never really had a democracy in Canada. Just some potted plants masquerading as leaders. It's time for the upgrade. It's time for Democracy 2.0. I'm Alan Finney, and I hope I've given you some food for thought.